Right, we are now on recording mode. And uh, in the last uh, few uh, uh, lectures, we've talked or we've anno tried to annotate the uh, sections of Pope's uh, epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot. In the first section, we noted how Pope is creating or carving out a picture of himself as the preeminent poet of the 18th century. In the second section, we saw how Pope uh, suggests what his uh, natural genius and motivation for writing satire was. In the third segment, we saw how Pope creates a gallery of uh, portraits of uh, his friends and foes, uh, especially through the portrait of his enemies, uh, rival poets, uh, Buffo uh, and Atticus. Uh, Pope is criticizing this system of literary coterie, uh, literary jealousies, and of course, of false patronage. So we've had two, uh, two portraits which not only talk about individuals, but which also talk about, uh, in, a, in a very significant way, about certain ills and problems of uh, the contemporary literary milieu. Now, in these, uh, we'll continue this third section through the portrait of fundamentally one individual and a reference to another, and that is uh, Sporus, uh, who will uh, represent Lord Harvey. H e r v e y, by the way, not H a r v e y. H e r v e y. Now, uh, Lord Harvey, incidentally, was uh, one of Pope's most trenchant uh, critics, incidentally, and who had satirized both Pope's uh, physical appearance, his parentage, his ordinary parentage, and uh, Pope's poetry. Uh, so there was a very sharp uh, enmity between uh, Lord Harvey and, and Pope. Now, Lord Harvey, incidentally, was very close to uh, Queen Caroline to, uh, and to Walpole, of course, through whom uh, Harvey actually uh, sort of uh, controlled the ears of the king. And uh, Lord Harvey also was uh, involved, was, was a very robust bisexual man in the sense that he uh, had married uh, and had children, but also was attracted towards young uh, males. So uh, all in all, Pope is here. Uh, and, and Harvey was a very effeminate man with a very weak constitution. So this is the portrait, along with Buffo, which is probably most juvenilian and which attacks uh, the, the personality. This is a direct attack on the personality of Lord Harvey. And in doing so, Pope is also attacking the practice of homosexuality. And he's also attacking the, uh, the concept of the dubious or the ambiguous gentleman of the 18th century, ambiguous in terms of sexuality, ambiguous and immoral in terms of morality as such. So Harvey becomes an epitome of, uh, of vice, as it were, of vice-ridden humanity, and therefore, the satire against uh, Sporus, as it were, is probably the sharpest of uh, uh, the, uh, the portraits in uh, Arbat Knot. And let me therefore try and read through uh, this segment and I'll be sharing my screen with you in a second. <clears throat> you will also note how suddenly intense this, uh, this entire tone of the satire becomes. Uh, mm, and just let me know whether you can see the, uh, the text, please. Yes, can sir. you? Yes, right. So let Sporus tremble. Uh, Pope had originally mentioned this as Paris, but then he thought that such an important character in Homer should not be, uh, should not be uh, mentioned. Sporus, incidentally, is taken from uh, the, the, the Sporus was Nero's castrated uh, partner, as it were, uh, that uh, Nero had uh, had a 
had a fascination for boys. So Sporus was one of these particular favorites of Nero who was castrated and who was therefore his homosexual partner. So in choosing uh, the character of Sporus to represent Harvey, Pope is deliberately uh, drawing upon his homosexuality. Please remember that at this point of time, homosexuality was still a crime. And a lot of uh, major uh, figures of the period, uh, although they were practicing homosexuality, a number of people had been hanged for, for being homosexuals, as it were. And uh, Harvey, therefore, uh, had sort of uh, not reacted that violently against uh, Pope's portrait. But Harvey had, of course, attacked Pope's poetry, Pope's parentage, Pope's uh, uh, stature, uh, short stature and health earlier. Right. So let's for us tremble what the thing of silk. The Pope is referring to uh, both Harvey's effeminacy, effeminacy, sorry, and he's also referring to Harvey's very weak constitution. Harvey suffered from diseases very frequently. So uh, Pope is referring to that thing of silk, sporus, that mere white curd of ass's milk. Now, ass's milk was seen as a tonic for people who suffered from weak constitutions. So Pope is obviously referring to uh, Harvey's weak health. Satire or sense, alas, can sporus feel who breaks a butterfly upon a wheel. Right, so who breaks a butterfly upon a wheel? So Sporus is like as fragile as a butterfly as it were. Yet let me flap this bug with gilded wings. Somebody has the microphone on. Please could you mute yourself? Right, uh, thank you. Uh, now, this painted, uh, le yet let me flap this bug with gilded wings. You know, bug has this uh, very, uh, uh, very, uh, very uh, gay innuendo of bugger in the sense of uh, of the sexual act. So yet, let me flap this bug with gilded wings once again, referring to his weak constitution. This painted child of dirt that stings and stings. So you see how intense the satire suddenly becomes. Harvey becomes, you know as it were, the, the homosexual act and the dirt associated with it. And Harvey becomes a, a figure of dirt, as it were, whose buzz the witty and the fair annoys, yet wit never tastes and beauty never enjoys. So the ineffective satirists. So well-bred spaniels civilly delight in mumbling of the game they dare not bite. Now, persistently, you know, you have this figure of Harvey as the poet whose poetry and satire is ineffective. Remember, uh, thy ineffective satires never bite, uh, as uh, as uh, Dryden says to uh, Fleck, uh, to uh, Shadron. Right, so Pope's uh, criticism is to the ineffective satirist in uh, Harvey. Eternal smiles his emptiness betray, as shallow streams run dimpling all the way, whether in florid importance he speaks, uh, Pope is referring to uh, Harvey's supposed importance because he was a homosexual. He was not. He was a very robust bisexual. Right. So uh, whether in florid importance he speaks, as the prompter breathes the puppet, but the puppet squeaks, or at the year of Eve, at the year of Eve, in this case, is uh, Queen Caroline. Uh, who was very close to Lord Harvey, and therefore uh, is suggesting that uh, Harvey whispers into the Queen of Carolyn and therefore gains a lot of prominence. Familiar toad, once again, you see the recurrence of this image of the toad. The toad was seen as an image of jealousy, was seen as an image of ugliness, was seen as an image of evil. Right, so familiar toad, half froth, half venom, spits himself abroad. In puns or politics, or tales or lies, or spite or smut, or rhymes or blasphemies, his wit all seesaw between that and this, now high, now low, now muster up, now miss. Now, once again, you see how Pope is suggesting uh, this act of homosexuality, where who is the master and who is the miss is ambiguous. Therefore, 
Pope is deliberately playing upon Harvey's, you know, as it were, unnaturalness and ambiguity in terms of morality and sexuality in this case. And he himself, one vile antithesis. Once again, you will obviously understand that the word vile here uh, refers to this uh, concept of sodomy, which was uh, seen as vile and unnatural. Right. Amphibious thing. Once again, amphibious in the sense, uh, neither man nor woman, neither male nor female, and a reference to his homosexual identity, that acting either part, the trifling head or the corrupted heart, pop at the toilet, flatterer at the board, now trips a lady, now struts a lord. And you see how, you know, he, he sort of, uh, how Harvey is moving from the role of the man to the male to the female. Eve's temper, thus the rabbis have expressed, a cheetah's face, face, a reptile, all the rest. So, you know, he's a sweet faced uh, evil being. Beauty that shocks you, parts that none will trust, wits that can creep, and pride that licks the dust. So, Harvey incidentally becomes here the, the figure of total corruption, as it were, like the serpent of the Garden of Eden. Harvey is seen as wholly evil a, char a character. Not fortune's worshipper, not, not fashion's fool, nor lucre's madman, nor ambition's tool, nor proud, nor survive, be one poet's phrase, that if he pleased, he pleased by manly ways. Once again, the reference to Harvey's effeminacy, effeminacy and thought a lie in verse of prose the same, but not, that not in fancy's maze he wandered long, but stooped to truth and moralized his song. That not for fame, but virtue's better end, he stood his furious foe, the timid friend, the damning critic half approving wit, the coxcomb hit, or fearing to be hit. Right, so Harvey is compositely built up as a man who lacks wit, who lacks virtue, and who lacks poetic ability. Laughed at the loss of friends he never had, the dull, the proud, the wicked, and the mad. Now that is the you know the epitome of what Harvey is. That one line, essential characteristic: dull, proud, wicked, and mad. The distant threats of vengeance on his head, the blow unfelt, the tear he never shed, the tale revived, the lie so often overthrown, the imputed trash and dullness not his own. The morals blackened when the writing scape, the libel person and the pictured shape, abused on all he loved or loved him spread, a friend in exile or a father dead. So a reference to his betrayal of all his friends and enemies alike. So Harvey is a man who cannot be trusted. He's amphibious, he's unnatural, he's mad, he's sexually uh, sort of disoriented, as it were, according to Pope. The whisper that to greatness still too near, perhaps yet vibrates on his sovereigns here. But uh, Pope is also referring to the fact that through Walpole and through Queen Caroline, Pope had access to the king, right, to the sovereigns, uh, not Pope, I'm sorry, Harvey had access to the king. Welcome for thee, fair virtue, all the past. For thee, fair virtue, welcome even the last. Right, so uh, Harvey is an antithesis entirely to, to virtue, as it were. But why insult the poor? Uh, affront the great, a knave's a knave to me in every state. Now he moves to a more general argument that he is a poet who will call a knave a fool a fool. So Pope is now trumpeting his honesty as a poet. I like my scorn if he succeed or fail. Sporus at court or Jaffet. Jaffet would be a, a, a kind of a, a figure who embodied forgery. So Jaffet is the forger, right? So Sporus at court or Jaffet in a jail. So Pope's, Pope is suggesting that my satire is directed towards any form of vice across all classes. So it might be a Sporus at court or a Jaffet in jail. A hireling scribbler. So whom does he direct his satire against? 
is directing his satire against Sporus, against the aristocrat, against the forger, against the high, the scribbler or a hireling peer, knight of the post corrupt or of the shire. So whether it be religion, whether it be nobility, whether it be the ordinary classes or whether it be the poets, Pope's satire is directed against any lack of virtue. If on a pillory or near the throne, pillory, of course, is where people would be tied and, you know, you could throw uh, uh, abuse at them. So uh, whether on a pillory punished by the state or near a throne or close to the nobility, he gains his prince's ear or lose his own. Yet by soft, yet soft by nature. Now, there's a very slight reference here to uh, Mary Montagu, Mary Watley Montagu, Lady Mary Watley Montagu, because Harvey and Lord Lady Mary Watley Montagu had together written satires against Pope and had bitterly attacked Pope's Pope personally. Now, Lady Watley Montagu was one of the most powerful uh, women of the period. So Pope merely mentions her as Sacco. He does not go into a very detailed portrait of her. So yet soft by nature, he more a dupe than wit. Sappho can tell you how this man was bit. This dreaded satirist is still referring to, uh, to uh, Harvey. Uh, Dennis will confess, foe to his pride, but friend to his distress. So humble he has knocked at Tibor's door, a uh, bad publisher, has drunk with Sibur. So Sibur, Kali Sibur was uh, the epitome of bad poetry, right? And uh, Ney has rhymed for more. Full 10 years slander. Did he reply? Once reply? 3,000 sons went down on Wellstead's life. To please a mistress, one has spurred his life. He lashed him not, but let her be his wife. Pope is referring to, uh, uh, to Harvey's wife who bore him children. Uh, who was once his mistress, let Bajal charge low Grub Street on his quill and write whatever he pleased except his will. Or let the two curls of town and court abuse his father, mother, body, soul, and muse. Right, now, uh, this is a reference to the attack against Pope because uh, the... His rival poets had attacked his father, his parents, as lowly born, body, Pope, Pope's deformed body, soul, and muse, muse as in poetry. Yet why? That father, now this is the last segment of the poem, actually, where Pope will talk about his honest parentage, his father as being a gentleman and virtuous, right? So, yet why? That father held it for a rule. It was a sin to call our neighbor fool. So Pope is suggesting that his parents were not base born, but were gentlemen and were virtuous. That harmless mother thought no wife a whore. Hear this and spare his family, James Moore. Unspotted names and memorable long, if there be force in virtue or in song. So uh, Pope is suggesting that his parents had lived uh, unspotted lives, had left, uh, lived uh, honored and unspotted lives. Uh, Pope's incidentally writes that his father was of a gentleman's family in Oxfordshire, the head of which was the Earl of Down. And he suggests that his mother was the daughter of William Turner of York, and she had three brothers. Uh, who, one of whom died in the service of uh, King Charles, right? So Pope is here uh, sort of uh, justifying his own uh, parentage as, uh, if not no noble, but, old, but of gentlemen. Now, the court of curl, incidentally, is Harvey, right? So the court of curl, where the two curls of town and court, right? So uh, the Harvey had written this pamphlet against Pope, and therefore 
uh, uh, Harvey had attacked uh, Pope's father as a mechanic, a hatter, and a bankrupt. Right. So uh, this was what was the attack against Pope's father. So Pope feels the need to justify uh, his father's honor, integrity, and gentlemanly birth. Right. So of gentle blood, part shed in honor's cause, that is the reference to his uh, mother's, uh, to his mother's brother, as it were, shedding his blood for the cause of King Charles. So of gentle blood, uh, part shed in honor's cause, while yet in Britain honor had applause, each parent sprung. What fortune, pray, their own. So they were self-made, as it were, and better got than bestiaires from the throne. Bestia was uh, a reference to the Duke of Marlborough, who was supposed to have been bribed, who, who took bribes. So he's saying that his parents earned honestly rather than taking bribes. Born to no pride, inheriting no strife, nor marrying discord in a noble wife, stranger to civil and religious rage, the good man walked innoxious, innocuous, that is, through his age. So Pope's father lived to be, uh, lived very honestly till a very long age. In fact, he died when he was 75. Pope's mother died uh, 93 years old. Right. So stranger to civil and religious rage, the good man walked in auctious through his age. No courts he saw, no suits would ever try. So he was not a litigator. He was not a person who undertook a quarrel, nor dared an oath, nor hazarded a lie. Now remember that Pope's father, Pope's parents, were Roman Catholics. And Roman Catholics were very often asked to take oaths and often lied. But Pope's father, he took the oath that he was a Roman Catholic and suffered because of this. He had to stay away from the court. Right. So his father was the point being that his father was honest to the court. Not dared an oath nor hazarded a lie. Unlearned. He knew no schoolman's subtle art, no language, but the language of the heart. So Pope is, in his creation of his self-fashioning, suggesting that his parentage comes from gentlemen who were honest, true to their faith. And if you see that the portraits that he makes of all his enemies were all hypocrites, and liars. So Pope is pitching his honest parentage against the dishonesty which is practiced by his rivals. So unlearned he knew no schoolman's subtle art, no language but the language of the heart. By nature honest, by experience wise, healthy by temperance and by exercise. His life though long to sickness past unknown, his death was instant and without a groan. Oh, grant me thus to live and thus to die. Who sprung from kings shall know less joy than I. So he's suggesting that though he's not born out of nobility, he's born to gentlemen parents. And this birth and this parentage is something which he's proud about. So Pope is fundamentally attacking the libel that he was born from base, bankrupt parents. So part of the autobiographical poem is also to justify his parentage. Right. Now comes the last, very last stanza of the poem, where Pope is now going to address Arbuthnot. You see, it's interesting that while the poem is an epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot, it is entirely about Pope. Right. So. At the very end of the poem, and Pope has just uh, had very few references to Arbuthnot. He's just talked about Arbuthnot's uh, care. He's talked about Arbuthnot's sagacity. He's talked about Arbuthnot giving him uh, proper advice and uh, asking him to be moderate. Now, in this last segment of the text, 
Pope addresses Arvat not. O friend, may each domestic bliss be thine. Quite ironic in the sense because <coughs> Pope was aware at this point that Arvat not was soon going to die. Be no unpleasing melancholy mind. Me, once again, he sort of addresses Arvat not, but goes back to himself. Me, let the tender office long engage to rock the cradle of reposing age. So he's seen as the kind of crusader satirist. The satirist and the crusader who will rock the cradle, will destroy the stasis of an age that is indolent or an age that has grown stale to virtue. With lenient arts extend a mother's breast, make languor smile and smooth the bed of death, explore the thought, explain the asking eye, and keep a while one parent from the sky. This is Arvat Not, who is lengthening lives, who is nursing patients. On cares like these, if length of days attend, may heaven to bless those days preserve my friends. Who is asking for uh, more age for his friend, which is once again ironic because Pope is aware that Arvat Not is terminal. But once again, you, you can sense a tone of generosity here. Pope is suggesting that people like Arbuth not, who are true, truly beneficiaries of mankind, should have long lives. Preserve him social, cheerful, and serene, and just as rich as when he served a queen. He was the queen's physician, if you remember. Whether that blessing be denied or given, thus far was right, the rest belongs to heaven. This is probably an illusion that he can sort of pray for that blessing. But whether that blessing will be given depends on heaven. So Pope is probably also mindful of the fact that, you know, Arbat not is uh, not very long with them. So this then is the text of the poem, right? So we have tried to take a look at or tried to divide this poem into various parts, you know, and taken, trying to take a look at its structure. We've argued, firstly, that this poem is about his self-projection, his self, uh, let us say, fashioning, and in many terms, autobiographical. autobiographical. Now, Pope is self-fashioning himself as, one, the most eminent poet of the 18th century, the satirist to whom everybody pays deference. And therefore, his house is you know, for, forever bombarded with budding poets. Secondly, he self-fashions himself as the man of honesty, integrity, taste, somebody who is committed to the cause of virtue and poetic correctness rather than, you know, false uh, praise. Thirdly, he sort of suggests that he's an isolated figure. It's very interesting. He's an isolated figure rather than Atticus who's surrounded by fawning uh, poets and he would rather remain independent so poetic independence and independence of judgment is something that pope is deliberately cultivating as part of self-fashioning he's also self-fashioning himself as the kind of a crusader who will rise against all fools and all names and all and anywhere where virtue is sort of um, attacked he also is responding to manifold accusations about his health. He's referring to his, you know, his long disease, his life, but he's still saying that in spite of this, he remains committed to the cause of satire. He responds to the arguments against his poetry, the arguments against his parentage, and he defines his parentage as honest and committed to religion and morality. And he is generous in his praise of Arbuthnot. So, different segments. There are passages which talk about his self fashion. There are passages where, you know, uh, Arbuthnot provides the impetus for moderation in satire rather than very direct uh, lampoon. So, there is this idea as to how the Horatian epistles will progress. There is a 
third dimension of Pope's you know, motivation about writing. So if birth is one part of his autobiographical self-fashioning, then the question about his motivation and methodology of writing is also something that comes under Pope's scanner. And Pope is describing how he writes uh, from the genius of his mind and how he has been encouraged by uh, his predecessors and creates a genealogy of good poets of which he is the climax. But finally, he also attacks through several portraits his detractors, which include uh, Addison, who becomes Atticus, and who is the figure who, uh, the poet who is egoistical and who embraces a coterie around him. He attacks Buffo, Doddington, who is the symbol of patronage and how uh, literary patronage uh, can create a system of power mongering and therefore promote uh, false poets. He suggests that therefore a lot of poets have been victimized and fallen into poverty of which he mentions gay. And finally he responds to uh, the vicious attack against him by uh, Harvey and Montagu and he criticizes Porus. Uh, um, uh, Harvey as porous and attacks Harvey as a figure of homosexuality, unnaturality, and vice. So this is what Arbuthnot is all about. The epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot is all about. Now, what we will discuss in our next uh, next uh, two odd uh, discussions would be the potential questions on uh, the episode to Dr. Arbuthnot. And we'll talk a little more in detail about uh, Pope and his uh, creation of uh, this, or Pope and his fashioning of the self. This is what I will be doing in the next uh, two classes, as it were, over the next two days. In the meanwhile, I'll uh, stop sharing, uh, stop the recording at this point of time, and allow you to ask your questions.